I don't know when you'll hear it. I don't know from whom you'll hear it. I'm not sure where you'll hear it, but I can virtually guarantee that you will hear it. At some point during the next few weeks, somebody, maybe a friend, maybe a family member, maybe a coworker, maybe even you, somebody will say something to the effect of, man, I just want it to be different this year. I, I want to capture, I want to experience the real meaning of Christmas because a lot of us have this sense that what Christmas has become and what it was supposed to be about, that those are two very different things. That the Christmas as we celebrate it and Christmas as it was originally conceived in the mind of God, that those are very different. They don't line up. And we're wondering, how can I get back to what Christmas is supposed to be about? How can I escape the commercialization and the materialism that's, that's come to be associated with this season? How can I experience in my heart a genuine, authentic Christmas? That's a longing that I bet a lot of us that are in this room have. I know I've got it. And so this year, as a church, we're going to participate in something you saw a promo for. It's called the Advent Conspiracy. And we're joining with churches across the country to restore some of the scandal, if you will, of Christmas by substituting compassion for consumption. We're going to recapture the transformational nature of this season by, by saying no to some of what Christmas has become so that we can say yes to some things that are close to God's heart. We're going to say no to the overconsumption and the overspending so we can say yes to what Christmas is really supposed to be about. But I want you right, want to warn you right now, the Advent conspiracy is... Uh, it kind of flies in the face of some of our established Christian Christmas traditions. And my guess is that some of you, as you think about what we're going to do during the, 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 the next few weeks, you may find yourself being a little bit unsettled and uncomfortable. But the fact of the matter is, Christmas is about Jesus. And Jesus, when you look at him, Jesus often said and did things that flew in the face of culturally established norms. You don't end up dying on a cross because you go around saying things that are palatable and make everybody feel good all the time. The Advent Conspiracy, it's designed to challenge us to take on one of the predominant empires of our day, and that is the empire of Christmas consumption. The belief that in order for Christmas to be Christmas, we've got to break the bank buying gifts for friends and family. The Advent Conspiracy is about people like us who claim to be followers of Jesus. It's about us taking our cues off of Him and not off our surrounding culture. It's about us living out what we say we believe. It's about us altering our approach to giving and to Christmas and to spending. It's not about diminished giving. It's not about no giving. It's about different kind of giving. It's about value-driven giving. It's about creative giving. It's about kingdom giving. It's about need-based and not merely want-based giving. Because think about this. Do we really need to be more comfortable and more entertained than we are right now. Especially when you consider the fact that about one-sixth of the world's population doesn't have clean water to drink. Where's the greater need there? Do we really need to buy our kids one more uh, flashing, chirping, battery-eating toy? Do we need to buy our spouse one more sweater that, that, that can be incorporated into a closet full of clothes, many of which they already don't wear? Do we need to buy our parents one more coffee mug with a cute saying on it or one more box of chocolates they really don't need? What would be more beneficial? To do that to buy our loved ones more stuff they really don't need, or to live out our faith in a way that tangibly demonstrates that Jesus makes a difference in our lives and the values that we live by. 
The Advent conspiracy, it is about people like us resisting a culture that tells us what to buy and what to wear and what to spend without any regard for an attention and glory on Jesus. And I really believe that if Jesus, as the saying goes, if Jesus is the reason for the season, then we ought to be queuing off him and not off our surrounding culture as to how we live out these next few weeks. And so during the next four weeks of Advent leading up to Christmas Day, we are going to embrace and investigate the following four themes. You saw them flash on the screen real quickly during that video promo. One is worship more. Christmas starts and ends with Jesus. It's about Jesus. And entering the story of Advent means approaching this season with an overwhelming passion to worship him to the fullest. And, and to realize that worship is not merely what happens in here. Worship is a daily life kind of thing. And hopefully we can worship him more fully and more completely. The second theme is spending less. Let me ask you this question. How often, I, I'm asking this question, I don't want to show of hands on this one because I know what the answer is going to be, so humor me. Um, how often have you bought a Christmas gift because you felt obligated to? We've all been there. As part of the Advent conspiracy, I'm going to ask you to spend less this Christmas. Not spend nothing, but just spend less than you normally spend and, and, and maybe, you know, maybe one less gift per person. And, and I realize that may not sound that significant, but my guess is those of us that are willing to take a flyer and do this will be more available to celebrate Jesus during this Advent season. And that's what I hope will happen as we spend less. The third theme is that of giving more. When you think about Christmas and the original gift of God's gift to us and Jesus, that gift was not a material gift that he gave us. It was a relational gift is a gift that was built on love. And so the Christmas season should be a time that is uh, built on love, a time when we can love our friends and our family in the most memorable ways possible. Maybe taking time to write your parents or writing your kids a letter telling them how much you love them. Taking time to bake, bake a batch of cookies and taking them to your neighbor. Doing things that say love. Time is the real gift that Christmas offers us. We can't get that at the store. We can't find that at the mall. So we've got to slow down if we're going to do that. And then the final fourth theme is that of loving all, loving everyone. When you think about the incarnation of Jesus, when you think about the journey of Jesus from heaven and earth to earth, he stepped away from the splendor of heaven to enter into the poverty of our world. And the Advent conspiracy is going to provide us who live with tremendous blessings, the opportunity to do the exact same thing, to express our love and to join Jesus in giving resources to those that live in extreme poverty, to those who really have the greatest need on this planet. So the next few weeks, we're going to flesh out these themes. That's kind of the direction we're going to be going. And my hope is that as a result, you'll have something that's a little bit countercultural in terms of your Christmas observance, that you'll give in some different ways and you'll free up some financial resources so that we as a church can make a kingdom impact. And our Advent conspiracy observance is going to culminate on Christmas Day. As you know, this year Christmas falls on a Sunday, Sunday, December 25th. And on that Sunday morning, we are going to receive as a church an offering for the Africa Water Wells Project that is administered by Nazarene Compassionate Ministries. That is an effort that is designed to provide fresh, clean drinking water to people in villages where they do not have that. And my hope is that each of us can participate in that. And my hope is that our giving will be more than a token amount or a symbolic gesture, that it'll be substantial. And that we as a church can have a sizable impact. I've got a figure in mind as to what I'd like us to do. I'm not going to tell you what it is. Couple reasons. Number one, um, I've seen your generosity in the few months I've been here, and I don't want to limit you. <laughs> but it's substantial. I'm convinced if we will each enter into this conspiracy, and if we each do our part, we will reach that figure, and we will go above and beyond, and we can do an incredible thing 
for people around the world and express the love of Jesus in a tangible, specific way to the least of these. Um, there's a couple of ways you can go about determining your gift for the Advent conspiracy offering we're going to take. One of them is just simply cutting back on your normal spending that you normally do for Christmas and setting aside the difference. That, that's, that's what Angie and I are, are going to do this year. We're going to scale back on how much we buy for our family, and, and, and we're going to give the difference towards the, towards the Water Wells Project. And, and towards that end, we've got something. It's not available. It'll be available, I think, next Sunday or the Sunday after. We've got some gift cards. They'll be ready that you can pass along to people that will basically say in their name, X amount has been given towards the Water Wells for Africa Advent Conspiracy Project here at Lakeside Community Church. Say so if, you, if you buy a, you know, if you're a parent and you buy a gift for your teacher, um, you can sit there, instead of giving them that basket of candy or a coffee mug or whatever you do, you can give them that gift certificate saying, in your name, $10 has been given to the Africa Water Wells Project for the Advent Conspiracy through Lakeside Community Church of the Nazarene. So we'll have those gift cards. You can pick up as many of them as you want and give them to as many people as you want. We'll keep printing them as long as you still keep claiming them and you can use them. And that's a way that you can participate in the Advent uh, Conspiracy. A second option is to use what's called an Advent Conspiracy Giving Calendar. I realize you can't read it from where you're seated right now. These are available... Um, they're available at the guest center in the lobby, and you can pick one up after the service this morning. And, and what this giving calendar is, is basically beginning on December 1st, there, there's a little factoid about the realities of life for many people and a challenge for us to give based on the blessings we enjoy. And it goes every day, December 1 through 24. In fact, let me, let me just read December 1, what it says, and then you can kind of get an idea of how this goes. December 1 says, for every cup of coffee sold by major coffee change, chains, farmers in coffee-going countries earn about three cents. Farmers in fair trade cooperatives, however, earn three to five times more than this. Give 10 cents for every coffee mug tucked away in your kitchen cabinet. And it's just an activity like that for every day, December 1 through 24. I think those of you that have kids at home, um, great way. To, to use it, and a great way to educate yourself as to uh, how a lot of people on this planet live. You don't have to use it every day. You can make use of every other day or, or specific days or whatever. It's, it's just simply there as something you can use and something that you can have fun with but also learn about how, be reminded how blessed we are and how a lot of people around this planet live. And so you'd simply just sit there and the days you participate, put the number out the side and then on the back you can just total it up and then on uh, Christmas morning when we have our worship service here that day, bring your gift and uh, use that to contribute to the Advent Conspiracy. I, I mean, I, I'm so excited about this emphasis for us. And, 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 uh, and I'm looking forward for us taking this journey together. I think it's going to be an incredible uh, journey that we do. Right now, I want to jump into the story of Advent and, and the first point of emphasis, the, the idea of worshiping more. Um, with that in mind, if you've got your Bibles, um, Luke chapter 2 is where I want us to focus this morning. Luke chapter 2 really gets into the heart of the birth narrative of Jesus, but I want to go down a little bit later in the chapter, uh, look at an account of something that happens a few weeks after Jesus is born. So beginning at verse 22 uh, of Luke chapter 2 is, uh, um, is where I want us to start. It says, when the time for their purification according to the law of Moses had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him, him being Jesus, the baby, they took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Yes, it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or, or two young pigeons. Let me, let me I, I realize there's a lot of... To, to understand what's going on here, there's a lot, lot of stuff about Jewish way they practiced and lived out their faith that I want to try to bring you along and, and help you understand. Many of you know the Jewish religion was one that had a lot of rules and regulations to it. And, and one of the rules and regulations stipulated that when a child was born, a woman could not reenter the temple 
for a number of weeks thereafter. She had to go through a purification ritual. And, and, and that ritual involved um, bringing a sacrificial offering. The offering was either a young lamb and a dove or a pigeon, or if the person was really, really poor, they could just bring a pair of doves or pigeons. And, and the Jewish law also stipulated that for every uh, firstborn male child, 30 days after that child was born, uh, you were to bring that child to the temple for a dedication ritual and practice as well. And so what we see happening here with Joseph and Mary and, and, and the baby Jesus is they're participating in this stuff that the Jewish religion spelled out that they were to do. They're participating in this purification ritual and, and this dedication ritual, and they're bringing this offering. And, and, and the inferences they can, we can draw from this, there's a couple of them. Number one, Jesus was born into a family that was very, very devout, that, that took their faith seriously. Joseph and Mary took their faith extremely seriously or they wouldn't have been doing this. But the second thing we can draw from it is that Jesus was born into a family that was extremely poor. Because you notice when they brought their offering that morning, they didn't bring the, the lamb and, and the pigeon or the dove. They, they brought just the pair of birds. And the thought kind of hits me when you look at Jesus and, and who he grew up to be and what he taught and, and all the things he had to say, his attention and, and, and his concern for the poor. I'm sure it reveals to us God's heart. I'm sure it spells out a, a, a wonderful ethic for us as Christians to live by. But, but I believe Jesus, when he talks about that, that he's more than... That, 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 from a purely st human standpoint, let me say it this way, from a purely human standpoint, I think part of the reason Jesus speaks to the poor and encourages us to be serious about taking care of the poor is because he grew up in a family that didn't have much. And he knew what it was like to be poor and what it was like to live hand to mouth. And so we, we, we see that here when they come to present this offering and they just have the pair of birds, the, the minimal offering that you could bring to participate in this ceremony. So, so picking up verse 25, the story continues. It says, Now there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon who was righteous and devout, and he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he'd seen the Lord's Christ. And so moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required. In other words, when they showed up to go through these uh, rituals that the, the Jewish law spelled out, Simeon took Jesus in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Again, there's some Jewish cultural stuff that, that, that we need to kind of work through to help us understand here. When it talks about Simeon in that 25th verse and says he was waiting for the consolation of Israel, what it simply means is that Simeon was, uh, he'd been anticipating the Messiah. And that was going around during this day and time. There was a great sense of anticipation and expectation that this, this, this old guy was, was ripe with anticipation for the coming of the promised deliverer that they had been hearing about through the prophets for, for years, for, for centuries. That, that, that this old guy was, was waiting for God to come onto the scene and, and make things right. And, and it says that God had apparently through the Holy Spirit communicated to him in some personal way that he was not going to die until he saw for himself this promised deliverer with his own eyes. So, so get, this, get this scene in your mind's eye if you can. You've got this poor young couple, probably upper teens in age, their firstborn son. They're walking into the temple and they cross paths with this old man that they probably had never met. They didn't know anything about. 
And evidently the Holy Spirit kind of nudges or prompts or prods Simeon in some way to where when he sees this child, he realizes this is the one. This is him. And think about it from Joseph and Mary's perspective. I mean, you've got to realize they, they, they've experienced their share of off-the-wall strange stuff surrounding the birth of this child already. It's been a pretty amazing journey to, to get them to this place. And now on this occasion, about a month after Jesus is born or so, they're, they're, they're making their way through this temple and this complete stranger who's been waiting for years for this moment walks up to them and upon seeing this little child they're holding, he asks if he can hold him and when he takes this child into his arms, he, he, he looks into his face and he's overcome with emotion. And he says some incredible things, some things like, God, now I can die in peace. God, you've made good on your promise and I see it for myself. He's the one. He's the salvation for my people. He's the salvation and the provision for the entire world. And if you were to go on and read through Luke chapter 2, we, we won't this morning. There's some other really interesting things that happen. You know, Simeon pronounces a blessing on them. And he looks at Mary and, 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 and tells her about this child, how he's going to have kind of a confrontational effect on the human race. And no sooner is Simeon done than this 84-year-old prophetess named Anna, she walks up and gets into the scene and basically confirms the words of Simeon and begins to praise and thanks God. It's, it's an amazing scene that I'm sure was overwhelming to Joseph and Mary. But as I think about it, there's one word that, that kind of sums it all up. There, there, there's one word that, that I want you to hang on. One word that, that, that I think can change our Christmas if we let, begin to figure it out and cultivate it in our hearts. And let me give you a hint as to what it is. It's there in the 28th verse. It says, Simeon took him, Jesus in his arm, and praised God. The word there for praise is the word in the Greek, oulageo. It's, it's, the, it's the same word that from which we get our English word eulogy. It's a word that means to bless or to celebrate with praises. You know, when we think of eulogies, we think of something that's reserved for a funeral or something, you know, if you're going to get a eulogy, you better be dead, you know. But, but that's not the original meaning of the word at all. That's not implied in the word. The picture here is of Simeon worshiping. Of Simeon just taking this baby Jesus into his arms and praising God and thanking God and celebrating what God had done. And for people like us who are longing to not miss the real meaning of Christmas this year, for people like us who have a hunger to escape some of the greed and the materialism of this season and to experience a genuine and authentic Christmas. Worship has the potential to ignite something in us that can be a game changer for how these next few weeks play out. If we could create the margin in our lives and allow ourselves to truly worship Jesus. If we could somehow not become preoccupied with the demands and the deadlines and the busyness and the expectation and the seasonal stress, and if we could let ourselves truly focus in on who he is and what he's done and what it says about the value God places on us by the fact that he's done it. If we could just kind of set some of this cultural stuff aside to where we could zero in on what it means for God to take the initiative and live among us and make the journey from heaven to earth and pay the price for our sin. I believe that would absolutely revolutionize these next few weeks for us. 
If we could concentrate our focus on Jesus and not let the cultural trappings and the social paraphernalia get caught in the way, and we could truly worship him in a comprehensive and a total and a complete fashion, I believe that we'd not only experience the kind of Christmas that we want to experience, I believe we'd begin to experience Christmas the way God meant for it to be experienced in the first place. And as I reflect on this story, here in Luke 2, the story of Simeon, one little detail that kind of just jumps out at me in verses 29 and 30, it, it says that when Simeon took the Christ child and held him in his arms and looked into his face, he said, Sovereign Lord, you can now dismiss your servant in peace. My eyes have seen your salvation. As I think about Simeon, there's a sense in which he's looking at this child and he's saying, I'm satisfied. My life's full. I don't need anything else. This is what I've been looking for. And I just find myself asking how many of us that claim to be followers of Jesus, how many of us can really truly, genuinely say that as we think about him? How many of us can honestly say, Jesus, you're my source of satisfaction. I, I don't need anything else. You make my life complete. My sense is if that was really and truly the case in our lives, we wouldn't get so caught up in the materialism, would we? We wouldn't get so caught up in this excessive regard for things that is so much a part of the cultural Christmas observance. If we could truly, like Simeon, find our sufficiency and satisfaction in Jesus, we wouldn't get trapped into the belief that we've got to spend X on Christmas, whatever X might be, that we've got to spend X on Christmas gifts for our family and our friends and our loved ones. Because that's what the surrounding culture expects. If we, like Simeon, could focus on Jesus and get lost in the wonder of who he is and truly worship him, I dare say it would revolutionize, it would radically alter the way the next few weeks are going to play out. And so I want to invite us to do that this morning before we go. I want us to utilize these final few moments of this time together to truly allow ourselves to just worship Jesus and to cut loose and enjoy his presence. We're going to wrap up this service, but this service begins our Advent celebration, and I think it's a wonderful way to get it started off on the right foot and in the right way, to authentically worship the one who satisfies us. To worship the one who meets our every need. To worship the one who fills our life with delight. And to worship the one who is at the heart of what this season is about. I want you to stand. And I want us to worship. And focus in our thoughts and hearts and minds on this Jesus. Who is at the very heart of this season. This will be a good start. To a wonderful season by focusing on the one who's at the very heart of it. Melinda and team, lead us as we worship and conclude our time together this morning this way. Lord, can we leave this room and hold that thought? I hope we can. Because if we can, it will change the way these next few weeks play out for us. I don't want us to get caught in the hubbub and the busyness. Is there a lot of stuff going on? Yeah. But there's something so special beyond the busyness that we need to lock on to. And we need to take deep and let it resonate in our heart. Let's let it do that. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this good start as we journey towards Christmas. And Father, I pray that you would be with each of us and continually bring our thoughts back 
to the gift of your son, the provision that you've made through him for each of us. And that, Father, our hearts might be tender to where we would worship you. And in that worship, Father, that we might, might sense you more fully and keenly in our lives. Thanks for a good day. Thanks for your presence here. And thanks for the assurance of your accompanying presence as we go from here. As we go, we want to do so with your blessing. We ask this in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks for being here today. Blessings on each of you. Remember, the Advent giving uh, calendars are available at the Guest Center. Feel free to pick one up. Have a good day. Next Sunday, 1030, Children's Musical. Look forward to seeing you for that.